Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And today's topic is one I've actually been wanting to do for a little bit uh, because it is the woman who really started the idea of celebrity trainers. And she also cemented the idea that Hollywood's beauties were aspirational figures for the average woman to try to achieve similar looks, which I, there's a whole bundle of psychology to discuss there, but uh, that is, that is not a history podcast. That's a different podcast. There's some baggage. (laughs) A lot of baggage. Yeah, there's a ton of baggage. And it's fascinating as we go through her story, you will hear a lot of things and practices and ideas that are very commonplace today, but were not at the time at all. Uh, She is a mix of kind of interesting and trailblazing and also like, there's some cringing. We'll talk. (laughs) You'll hear about the cringy parts. Uh, Her name was Sylvia Olback. Uh, You will see that spelled two different ways, sometimes with two L's and sometimes with one. And the reason is that she almost never used her last name. Uh, She went by Sylvia or Sylvia of Hollywood or Madam Sylvia. But in anything, even her books are written as... Sylvia of Hollywood, you never see her actual name appear in them. Yeah. I also saw some places where it was spelled with an E instead of an A, so it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. Uh, And in the 1920s and 1930s, she became a star in her own right, known for shaping up starlets to get them screen ready. And heads up, obviously this episode is going to be talking about things like body image and weight loss in ways that are in some ways completely sensible, and in others, utterly ludicrous and really dangerous and unhealthy. So if that's a sensitive topic for you, just know that going in. Uh, Additionally, Sylvia was known to be really harsh and direct in her criticism of people's bodies, so that is a whole other angle. If hearing people be very mean to other people is problematic, this might not be the episode you want to hang out with. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Because she could be really harsh. One of the few photos of her that uh, you can find on the internet is literally of her preparing to hit someone because they're slouching. Yes. I have the book that that photo appeared in. She's showing how you should teach your friends to do it. Well, <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> because her idea is that, uh, we don't talk about this a lot later, so I can say it now, a lot of her books where she's talking about things that she would do as a trainer, she wants, like, people to have a a workout partner so they can do some of the stretches together and stuff, but also can hit each other in the back when they're not exhibiting good posture. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Like I said, it's a mixed bag. She was born Sylvia Waller in 1881 in Oslo, Norway, to an opera singer mother and an artist father. Her grandparents were her primary caregivers, in part because her parents both had really demanding careers, but also because she lost her mother when she was still a girl. Her mother, Emily, died in 1891 when Sylvia was 10, and then Sylvia claimed in interviews that her family referred to her as an ugly duckling, and that really catalyzed her interest in beauty. Yeah, we should also say, uh, and we talk about this a little, that Sylvia is also a little bit tricky because she crafted her persona very carefully in the media. So we don't know how much of the things she said about her life previous to becoming a well-known figure in the United States are true versus how many are kind of crafted to develop that persona. So we don't know if they really called her an ugly duckling, but that's what she said. Uh, As a young woman in the 1890s, Sylvia, against the wishes of her father, decided to pursue nursing as a career. Uh, I had read at one point that she had wanted to be a doctor, but that was not an avenue open to her. She claimed uh, later on when she was recounting her life to have studied under a Dr. Ulrich in Copenhagen, but there is a little bit of fuzziness about whether she actually took any medical courses while she was there. She did learn massage during this time and would describe what she learned as a sort of medical massage, manipulating the body for medical purposes. To be clear, the mid to late 1800s were a time when massage was being integrated into an approach to wellness that involved massage and calisthenics as a way to improve your digestion and mood and fatigue, among other things, similarly to how a lot of folks talk about massage today. So it's really not especially unusual that Sylvia would talk about this link between massage and medicine. We just don't have any hard evidence that she had actual medical training. Yeah, and in uh, the parts of Europe where she lived was where this whole idea of of massage and wellness being linked and also physical activity was really getting sort of the most 
interest in research. Yeah. Um, so she was kind of in the hotbed for that to be a very real discussion she would have been uh, a part of or at least had access to. Yeah. As a former massage therapist, <laughs> I will also say it was a lot more common to call massage therapist masseuses at the time which will, like, come up later on in the episode. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting thing. I was looking up usage of that word, and a lot of people still use it, but other people find it not so good. Uh, I used it in her case because she used it about herself. Right. Um, And sometime in the late 1890s, while she was doing these studies, Sylvia met a man named Andrew Olbeck, and the two were married. The exact date of their wedding is not known. It's estimated to have happened sometime in 1900, probably. And the couple had two sons. Uh, And the way that marriage was uh, and was characterized by Sylvia shifts a little bit depending on what interview with her you might read. So in some, she describes it as a very happy union. But at other times, she mentions that after Andrew returned from fighting in World War I, understandably, he was a very different man and that affected their relationship. And they were maybe not so close. Sylvia was a master of self-promotion. And once she told a story to the Hartford Current about her relationship with Andrew leading her to a life of calisthenics and healthy eating, she claimed that she had put on some weight during their marriage until she weighed more than 150 pounds at five feet tall. After seeing Andrew flirting with a slender secretary, Sylvia vowed to learn about reducing and got her own weight down to 95 pounds, which was her weight for most of the rest of her life. It's really not clear if this story is true or if it was just more of a yarn spun by Sylvia to bolster her image as a weight loss expert. In the summer of 1921, Sylvia, Andrew, and their children moved from Copenhagen to the United States. Before the war, Andrew had a successful lumber business, but the post-war economy made it impossible to keep that company going. So they moved first to New York and then shortly thereafter to Chicago. In Chicago, Sylvia started working with the family of Julius Rosenwald. And if that name sounds familiar, he was mentioned in our episode on Sears history. He was a partner in the Sears Roebuck and Company business. We've talked about wanting to do an episode on him at some point, too, Sylvia was hired to help the family matriarch recover from an injury, and she exceeded all their expectations in that role. After Sylvia's massage treatment got the woman back on her feet in less than a week, the family put her on retainer as their massage therapist. Sylvia was paid $1.50 daily for this role, which was a good income at the time, but through the, the Rosenwalds, she also had interactions with other wealthy and famous people who also became her clients. Yeah, their grandmother had apparently hurt one or both of her kneecaps when she fell. So she'd had a lot of difficulty walking, and Sylvia apparently appeared as a miracle worker to them. Uh, And through those connections that she made through the Rosenwald family, Sylvia eventually found herself pulled to Hollywood. She had made several connections to the entertainment industry while working for the Rosenwalds, and eventually one or more, the story of which celebrity, or if there were several, uh, shifts a little bit, urged her to move to Los Angeles and attend to the needs of the actresses there full-time. So in 1925, Sylvia made the move to the West Coast. She was in a good position from the start for a number of reasons. For one, she had a lot of clients already waiting for her when she arrived. And for another, this was a time when there was a surge of body consciousness, which created a really fertile ground for a health and beauty business to grow. The ideal body type, in quotation marks, had shifted from the hourglass shape of the Victorian era and the Gibson girl to a more boyish and less voluptuous figure. Uh, A lot of women were eager to be told how to achieve a slim figure. And so this idea of reducing, and we put that in quotes because that's what it was called at the time, was all the rage. And it was often marketed to women throughout the United States as the way to become happy and beautiful. Yes, that is totally damaging language. Uh, This is really a time when fat shaming as a means of advertising first became common in the U.S. And products to help women reduce were often downright dangerous. Uh, Related to our recent episode, for example, on radio iodine therapy, Some women even turned to medication that would essentially put their bodies into a state of hyperthyroidism to lose weight. We talked in that episode about how that is a dangerous state to be in for your body, so obviously not a good plan. The film industry was still in its infancy, and it was taking off at this same time in a way that really created celebrity actors. So these standards of beauty were often really closely tied to these starlets who were appearing on screen as the aspirational figures that women should strive to emulate. 
And coming up, we're going to talk about how one magazine actually tried to combat this unhealthy uh, approach and the unhealthy products that were being marketed to women and how that really set the stage for Sylvia's rise to fame. But first, we're going to pause and have a little sponsor break. Just as quickly as these false claim weight loss products became regularly advertised, the American Medical Association denounced them as both fake and dangerous hogwash. Photoplay Magazine, one of the most popular film periodicals of the time, ran a three-part expose on what was called Reducomania titled Wholesale Murder and Suicide, which opened with the line, quote, In their efforts to reduce, thousands of American women are ruining their health and preparing their bodies for tuberculosis and other diseases by lowering their resistance. The preface to this article made the magazine's strong stance on this matter really clear. It said, quote, Photoplay magazine refuses to admit to its advertising columns any internal reducing preparations or questionable methods. Photoplay is going to fight to the end to force these dangerous preparations from the market. Why is the sale of mind and body wrecking drugs prohibited and the sale of dangerous reducing nostrums permitted? After its investigation and exposure of reduction drugs is completed, Photoplay believes that national action will be necessary. Medical quacks must be prevented from killing American women, and American women must be prevented from committing suicide in the pursuit of fashion. And that series, written by a fairly well-known journalist at the time, Catherine Brody, discussed the use of thyroid treatment as a weight loss aid, women who developed mental health disorders as a result of their anxiety related to their bodies, and it even talked about the death of actress Barbara Lamar as it built its case against the dangerous claims of the medical quacks that it sought to expose. She had died not long before this article from, I believe, a heart failure which is how it was publicized, but really she had been doing some very foolish things trying to become incredibly thin. That article also stated pretty clearly that there is no such thing as an ideal figure, but merely trends that shift and lead to these problematic situations as reducomania as a craze. And this whole uh, series concluded with exercise tips that were from a more sensible approach to fitness. It was like, maybe you should, if you want to be healthy, just eat well and take care of your body and don't worry about what people say it should look like. As the discussion played out in papers and magazines, the concept of a diet and exercise regimen that was meant to achieve a slim look rather than using a pill or a cream started to take shape and enter Sylvia Olbeck. Sylvia was essentially already doing similar work to what Photoplay and other journals were touting as a more reasonable approach to health and beauty. She had developed a three-part approach to health and beauty that combined a healthy diet, exercise, and massage. From the mid-1920s on, Sylvia was working with clients both in her home in Los Angeles and in their homes. She would go over what they were eating, give them massages, and teach them exercises to get and keep them in shape for their on-screen work. And this is still an industry. She was a trailblazer in this regard. And as she built a clientele and a reputation for getting results, she emerged as something of a celebrity in her own right. She started fielding requests for interviews to give advice and tips to magazine readers that would mirror the work that she was doing with celebrity clients. Yeah, this really, like, was where her career exploded. One of those celebrities that she worked with, incidentally, was Mae Murray, who we mentioned in our donut episode. Murray was the one that's given credit for inventing dunking by accidentally dropping a donut in her coffee. Uh, But she had hired Sylvia to go with her on her vaudeville tour starting in September of 1927. In April 1928, so just a few months later, their business relationship had fallen apart, and eventually they went to court. Olbach said that the actress had failed to pay her and sued Murray for her unpaid wages. And the court found in Olbach's favor, and she won $2,000. She also swore off exclusive contracts after that. That desire to stay away from becoming one star's exclusive masseuse and advisor was just almost instantly problematic. Gloria Swanson desperately wanted to be Sylvia's only client, even after Sylvia said no repeatedly, Eventually, Swanson appealed to Joseph Kennedy at Pathé Studios to step in. Kennedy did. He offered Sylvia a contract to work exclusively with the studio's stars, including a clause that Swanson had to get priority over everyone else. And Sylvia took that job, and it became something of a stepping stone for her career. Because she had carved out this unique space for herself in Hollywood, she was also a source of fascination for the press. 
She was in the job less than two years, but gave dozens of interviews during that time. And her message in those interviews resonated with the public. She felt that beauty was in your mind first and that you had to work on your confidence to achieve the body that you desired. She focused on health as a means to achieve beauty. Sylvia was said to work miracles through a very direct, no-nonsense approach that did not baby her clients. She could be sharp and critical, but people found this appealing instead of off-putting. Her tough truthfulness was a departure from the ways stars were used to being treated. Additionally, her promotion of a healthy lifestyle was a breath of fresh air at a time when Hollywood was seen as being indulgent and debaucherous. Yeah, she really sort of became a good bit of PR for Hollywood when it was like, no, we're employing this woman who talks about not drinking and not eating bad things and not being self-indulgent and aren't aren't we the paragons of good, healthy living? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was it was in the studio's interest to promote that they were working with her. But while she was in her studio contract, Sylvia also got caught in the middle of a bunch of Hollywood drama because of her clients, which she did not enjoy. When Gloria Swanson's husband's mistress, if you can follow all of that, uh, whose name was Constant Bennett, was signed on as a talent with the studio, Gloria and Constance started battling over everything, including Sylvia's time and attention. And just to be clear, this is not a case where Swanson was a spurned wife acting out of hurt. She was having her own affair with the head of the studio, Joseph Kennedy. It was a big morass of people uh, all cheating on one another and being devious and having just terrible relationships. At one point, Bennett, according to Sylvia, even tried to bribe her to be her exclusive masseuse with an expensive sapphire ring. Sylvia was loyal to Swanson and refused, but this tug of war that the two women were playing over her just exhausted and frustrated Sylvia. It started a sentiment that Hollywood just might not be worth the trouble. Yeah, she definitely reached a point where she thought Hollywood was getting more out of the relationship than she was. Uh, in another case of perfect timing, uh, just as she had kind of landed on the Hollywood scene as this desire to shift away from some of the more foolish approaches to, to losing weight uh, was happening. When the 1929 crash happened, it really didn't damage Sylvia's business. That signaled the end of the flapper era and the excess of the Roaring Twenties. And so her more sensible methodology was actually bolstered and her business continued to thrive, although it did go on a different path. Instead of treating individual clients, she took her advice on health and beauty to the masses by starting a writing career. By the time Sylvia left her studio gig in 1930, her name had significant star power of its own. In fact, when she left her studio contract behind, almost every other studio in Hollywood started making her offers, but she didn't take any of them. She had initially told the press that she wanted to work with anybody she pleased and not be limited by exclusivity deals with a studio, but she never really reestablished her client-based business. Instead, she started writing articles for the weekly general interest periodical Liberty. And these articles were actually touted as being written by Sylvia's, quote, indiscreet secretary, which was actually ghostwriter James Whitaker. Presumably, they were published that way in an attempt to shield Sylvia from blowback because she told a number of Hollywood secrets in her article series, which ran for two months and was titled, A Masseuse Looks at the Stars. The article series was also adapted into a book called Hollywood Undressed, which came out in 1931. And despite the effort to claim the info was leaked by a secretary, Sylvia of Hollywood became a contentious figure in the film industry. The book adaptation contained both anecdotes of her time working with film stars, as well as the diet and exercise advice that she gave to them. And in the process, she talked in detail about the private lives of the rich and famous. She mentioned her feud with Mae Murray, and she described the actress's bad marriage and hinted that Mae's husband was abusive. She also called out various entertainers as fat and lazy, and she outed people for various minor illegal activities. She pointed out who in Hollywood broke prohibition, for example. And it seemed that she had turned and bitten the hand that had been feeding her for years. Some actors actually called for a boycott of Ulbach, and those who did not were still pretty vocal that her career in Hollywood was over. There were a handful of exceptions that were like, ah, that's just Sylvia. But for the most part, she was quickly becoming persona non grata. Sylvia vehemently denied that she had done anything wrong and argued back and forth with various Hollywood figures through reporters. She was insistent that she was not about to back down because the very people that she had called spoiled were mad at her for it. 
She gave statements to the press that anyone was welcome to come and talk with her or even give her a sock in the jaw. She also said that people could be as mad as they liked, but they still needed her treatments. Just the same, whether she had intended to all along or if it was precipitated by all the conflict, Sylvia moved away from Los Angeles. And there is some debate also about just how much of the writing that went into Hollywood Undressed and the articles that preceded it was really the work of ghostwriter James Whitaker. Whitaker was the ex-husband of actress Ina Clare, and he had his own axes to grind in Hollywood. So some people shifted the focus off of Sylvia and onto him, claiming that Sylvia could not have understood some of the nuances of cutting phrasing that were used in the book because she was a non-native speaker of English. We'll talk next about the evolution of Sylvia's career after her break with Hollywood, but first we'll take our own break and hear from one of the sponsors that keeps the show going. It turned out that Sylvia spilling Hollywood gossip was actually a pretty brilliant business move. Whether she truly disdained the famous people who had come to her for help in her time in Hollywood... In calling them spoiled, frivolous, and indulgent cinema children, she appealed to a much broader audience of readers who were dealing with the early years of the economic depression and had their own negative opinions about the spoiled entertainers of the film industry. The time when all of this was going on was a significant moment in Sylvia's life for other reasons, too. When she left Hollywood to move to New York, she did so alone. Her husband, Andrew, and their two sons, who were adults at this point, all stayed in L.A., Yeah, her sons were both working in the entertainment industry, not as actors, but in various other roles. Um, And Sylvia's life in New York involved a lot of efforts in different areas. She made appearances at department stores to talk about health and beauty, and she had started a line of cosmetics, with which Andrew was basically running that part of the business, and so she would go and promote those cosmetics in stores. But she also dabbled in new areas, including writing a satirical play about Hollywood with playwright Edith Ellis Furness, and even appearing on stage stage in a couple of vaudeville acts. That play that she wrote never was actually uh, produced, by the way. But in the end, it was her status as a health and beauty expert that kept her afloat, even as the Depression wore on. In 1932, the year after she arrived in New York, she started working for Photoplay magazine as a regular columnist. She wrote for the magazine for three years, using that platform to continue and share her knowledge about exercise and healthful eating, And it's interesting to note that even as she advised women on how to achieve the figure they desired, she tended to focus it on women making themselves happy. It was never about pleasing or catching a man. We have to note here, though, as we said at the top, there's there's some conflict. Because even though she was insistent that there was no single ideal body type, uh, she did insist that you had to be slim. Uh, So it is a little bit of a mixed bag. She was very clear that women had to get over the laziness of their bodies and minds if they wished to reduce. And she remained her very direct and sometimes quite harsh self. At one point, in response to reader questions, she she didn't do, like, a, a direct reply, but she wrote in her article, either get... Get some brains or stop reading my stories. I'm sick and tired of the silly questions a lot of you ask. (laughs) Not the most nurturing approach. (laughs) And this reminds me a little bit, I think it was about Annette Kellerman, who was the woman who made swimming a lot more accessible to Mm -hmm. other women, particularly mostly white women at the time, and how she also got into, like, some beauty tips as part of her thing. And it was like she would sort of simultaneously say, there is nothing wrong with you. It's society's expectations of you are what to blame. But at the same time, she would be sort of like, but here's how to meet those expectations, though. Right. Yeah. uh, I feel like Sylvia, in some ways, invented the concept of the tough love trainer. (laughs) Um, Yeah, she could be very, very harsh. She did make some interesting connections between physical wellness and mental wellness, though. Though sometimes that really turned out to be about how crying makes your skin puffy and unattractive. She was also a proponent of positivity and obviously hard work. And she told readers that these were just as valuable to being happy as any weight that they might lose. In 1932, after 31 years of marriage, Sylvia shocked her husband Andrew by asking for a divorce. 
While she had moved to New York alone, they had remained married and seemed uh, to be pretty amicable at that point. It is always, of course, unclear what a relationship is truly like from the inside, and we don't know if there were troubles before this. But in the press at that point, Sylvia and Andrew had seemed very contented together. But once she was in New York, Sylvia met someone. That someone was actor Edward Leiter, who was 22 years younger than Sylvia and who really swept her off her feet. At the end of June 1932, Sylvia and Andrew were divorced in Mexico, and three days later, she married Leiter, who stayed with her for the rest of her life. As Sylvia continued to write, she still used her Hollywood experiences as material, even though she had left Hollywood behind. She wrote a series in which she used famous actresses as examples of different body types and advised readers on how to achieve a similar level of fitness. It was an early sort of synergistic journalism where Photoplay could use this popular column to then promote the latest entertainment. Uh, it's kind of like its own little custom content studio going on. And in la- a later series, she wrote as though she were writing to celebrities to tell them what was wrong with them and how to fix it. These are, to me, troubling to read because she's basically like, here's what's wrong with you. (laughs) She would tell an actress, for example, that her face was too fat and then outline a plan to address the issue of her critique. In 1932, Olbeck found herself in a new role, which was radio host. General Electric and Ralston sponsored the radio show Madame Sylvia of Hollywood. On each show, Sylvia recounted working with a specific celebrity, starting with the story of how any given woman came to be her client, usually at the urging of studio executives. These stories were played out as reenactments with actors. Sylvia herself only briefly appeared each week. Yeah, it would be like, here's what happened, and here's how I fixed it. Ta-da! Happy ending is that she was beautiful in this film. Um, A second book by Sylvia was published in 1934. This one, titled No More Alibis, became a bestseller. And the opening chapter extols the virtues of a healthy lifestyle, and it is a mix of Sylvia's stern and direct manner. For example, she writes, quote, Stop being lazy. Stop wishing for good looks when all you have to do is get them by making the effort. And it's also got a healthy dose of encouragement. Uh, For example, she writes, quote, And believe me, I'm for you. I think every one of you who really tries is swell. The world is yours. Take it. It's your right. She lays out a very clear ideology in this text. People eat too much and, moreover, eat unhealthy foods and then don't get enough exercise. It's the same simple advice that a lot of trainers still give today. And she also touched on elements of mental health in the book, particularly noting that nervousness was a normal reaction to the demands of modern life. She wrote, to be ambitious is fine, but there is such a thing as being eaten up with ambition. She recommended massage to counter nervousness and anxiety. That works for me. The massage part. (laughs) Yeah, some of her advice is great. And the diet that Sylvia recommended for reducing in the book was fairly straightforward. It featured a breakfast of grapefruit or orange juice, black coffee, and Melba toast or rye wafers with honey, but no butter. Lunch was liquids only, tomato juice and a large bowl of clear vegetable soup with black coffee or tea with lemon to drink. No sugar, of course. For dinner, the woman seeking to reduce could have a fresh fruit cup, a lettuce and tomato salad sprinkled with parsley, a small portion of broiled or roasted meat, potato skin seasoned with a little salt only, and for dessert, gelatin, a baked apple, or stewed fruit, no sugar added. I would cry on this diet. Mm. Um... There are some problems there. That was my weary sigh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, I mean, for the time, her ideology was that, no, I'm I'm putting together a balanced menu, but we know a lot more about nutrition now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that not the same nutrition will work for every person, whereas she was pretty much like, do this, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, and even the whole idea, like, there are a lot of things that claim to be about nutrition but are really about weight loss. like <laughs> Right. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> like, a lot of times people are marketed these things in a way that it makes it seem like it's the same thing when it's really not. There are also plenty of exercises aimed at reducing and in sculpting various parts of the body. In a lot of cases, massage is also prescribed to melt away the pounds. This whole book is full of quips like, a fat back mars your figure and posture and makes people think you're older than you really are. There's also a chapter dedicated to the needs of people who need to put on weight. She also advises to have a friend give you a hard whack on the back if they see you slouching, which we talked about at the top of the show. Yeah. 
uh, please don't any of my friends whack me on the back. Just tell me I'm slouching. I also uh, just want to <laughs> note that there's a difference between, like, you and a friend deciding to do something together to support each other and, like, policing your friend's behavior, which seems right. to be more her jam here. Yeah, I mean, I think she wants to be the person that polices your behavior. She does kind of make it like, you should have a friend do this stuff with you. But she wants to yell at you about your posture for sure. <laughs> Um, the second half of the 1930s saw a lot of activity in Sylvia's writing career, both in terms of volume and in terms of where it appeared. She abruptly left Photoplay magazine and started writing for a competitor, Modern Screen. But then she went back to Photoplay as the beauty editor, in part because they had received so many letters from people wanting her to come back. Uh, and she also wrote articles for physical culture. Her articles during this time followed the same sorts of formulas that her early writing had often using stars as examples, and then telling readers how to get similarly pleasing figures. Although she did always warn that you shouldn't try to make yourself a carbon copy of anyone, but just be your best self. Her writing topics expanded, though, to include her thoughts and advice on parenting and marriage. She wanted parents to teach their children about a healthy lifestyle from the very beginning to set them up for a healthy life. When it came to marriage, it was less progressive, essentially urging women who found themselves in lackluster marriages to recapture their youthful figures to reinvigorate their husband's interest. Yeah, she did talk a lot in her writing about how... um, I am more than 20 years older than my husband, but I look so young that that's how I keep him. And, like, it, there's a lot of that going on. So, uh, and she did look very young for her age. But, yeah, it's a lot of, like, this is how you stay happy in your marriage. Um, in 1936, she wrote the book Pull Yourself Together, Baby, which discusses diet and exercise, but in the framework of a person's personality. It made the case that your personality was a reflection of your physical health. And this was sort of intended as a follow-up to No More Alibis, employing a similar work ethic to cultivating character once your physique is in pretty good shape, all with the idea of becoming as beautiful as any of her Hollywood clients. Olbeck's last book was Streamline Your Figure in 1939 and was published after she had stopped writing articles for magazines. It was once again a return to her more body-focused advice and less about personality, but it was really last in a series of efforts to try to stay relevant. In the late 1930s, the Nazi ideology of a physically superior race and talk of physical perfection made it hard for someone in the business of telling people how to make their bodies as perfect as possible to stay in favor in the United States. Additionally, as the world found itself in a very serious conflict, beauty culture, even Sylvia's relatively sensitive approach to it, started to feel frivolous. After the publication of Streamline Your Figure, Sylvia stepped away from the spotlight entirely. On the 1940 census, under occupation, she was noticed as a housewife. Her life after that was apparently quiet, and little is known about it in terms of specifics. She and Edward bought a house in Santa Monica, California, where they lived out the rest of their lives. Edward died in February 1975, and Sylvia died a month later at the age of 94. Reading any of Sylvia's writing, which I... I sort of have an almost guilty pleasure level of it. Like, I really like reading it. Uh, But it is definitely a mix of, yeah, these are good ideas and complete and total cringes. Uh, In many ways, her rhetoric is so much about empowerment and positivity and getting what you want out of life. But then she also writes things along the lines of saying the Great Depression was actually good for Americans because it made them stop being physically and mentally soft. Uh, She also could be incredibly harsh, writing things that uh, always suggested that any bodily issues were the individuals to overcome, even when they were things like actual disabilities. Like, she talks in some of her books about, like, if you have very severe bow legs, if you just work out and get the outside of them thinner, then you'll look almost normal. Like, it's a little dicey. That's Um, a lot dicey. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, she definitely does not give any leeway for people to have anything but a pretty healthy, standardized life and figure. Like, she puts all of the onus on you as though any problem or defect you have is kind of your own fault. Yeah. Well, an idea that then people are automatically healthy is just not true. (laughs) Nope. There are, though, some gems you can find reading her work. Some of them come off as funny just because she's so curt. And then some of them do seem like pretty good advice. So we thought we would close with a handful of them. So first is, um, I legitimately love this advice. 
There is a funny side to everything that happens. Look at that side. Then there's eat properly, live properly, exercise regularly and properly, I might add. Use your noodle and stay away from quackery and hocus pocus. That's pretty good advice. Um, The next is, you've got to have courage and grit to be beautiful. And you've got to stop whining. (laughs) I think that might maybe should go on a shirt. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Every woman can be charming if she'll let herself be. And then uh, this one, remember this, self-assurance, the self-respecting kind, is a first and ever-present necessity of personality development. Finally, there's this opening passage from her first photo play article titled, Any Woman Can Be Beautiful. I say any woman can be beautiful, and I mean it. You can't all have lovely features, but you can be beautiful. Whoever said beauty is only skin deep is a fool. Beauty begins behind your forehead, and the beauty of some of the loveliest women I know can never be registered by a motion picture camera. Now here's the amazing part of it. You can make yourself beautiful. You can, if you have the nerve and the courage, do it all yourself. That's kind of like the best of Sylvia in that (laughs) one, because then, you know, uh, you'll find something less delightful if you keep reading. Yeah, she's such a mixed bag that that's part of what's really fascinating about her to me. Uh, like I said, I'll read her stuff and be like, yeah, that's great. Oh, oh, what did you just say? No! It's all over the place. Sylvia. Do you have some listener mail for us? I do. I have a postcard from our listener, Jane. She writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, thank you so much for the amazing show. Recently, I went to the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, and this painting on the front caught my eye. When I looked at the artist, it was Vigée Lebrun. I was amazed to see what a great artist she was. My mom was surprised when I started spewing a bunch of facts about her, but it was so cool to know part of the story behind a cool painting. Could I request more Asian history? Also, some more sad royal childhoods because I'm a terrible person? (laughs) Thanks again doesn't make you a terrible person. It just makes you interested in those. Um, Yeah, so it's a a beautiful picture of uh, Princess Advokia Ivanova Goltsina that was painted in 1799. It's absolutely beautiful. I I had been sharing on social media as we traveled through France, my trip to the Louvre, in which I stood in front of the four Vigée Le Blancs that they have all in one room, crying like a child. So oh. I, I like lost it full grade um, because her artwork is so beautiful. Like no one captures light and skin the way she does. I absolutely love it. So I'm always glad when anybody discovers a piece of art. Tracy and I have talked about it recently as well. Um, if you would like to write to us, you should do that, whether that's about art or anything you would like. You can do that at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. MissedInHistory.com is also the website URL where you can come and find us and check out all of the episodes of the show that have ever existed, including show notes for any that Tracy and I have worked on together. You can also subscribe to this podcast. I think you should. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 